Okay, this week we have an interesting little chat with Jeremy Bernstein. I'll fill you in more during the interview. But uh, just another note, uh, again this week we have little Skype schmutz in there. Um, I don't know exactly what's causing it, but it seems like we might have found a culprit in a rogue Dropbox instance. So uh, anyway, we hopefully have cleaned that up for the future, but towards the end it gets a little messy. Just plow through it because there's great stuff. I hope you enjoy and I'll see you at the backside. Okay, this week I am going to introduce you to somebody that I've known for a long time. I've worked with him for a long time. Every time we get together, it seems like it's old friends talking. It's really, it's really cool. He's a, an amazing developer, um, but also a guy with a real great variety of interests. His name is Jeremy Bernstein. Um, he's one of the developers at Cycling74. Uh, he's got a long history of performance and artwork. And he's got some new obsessions that he's into. So with that, I'm going to introduce you to Jeremy Bernstein. Hi, Jeremy. How are you? I'm good. Thanks for inviting me. Well, thanks a lot for joining us. Uh, this is kind of a real treat for me because, uh, like I just said, I always feel like every time you and I talk, it's just like old friends getting together again, you know? It's, uh, <laughs> I know what you mean. It's, uh, it's super and it's, uh, it'll be nice to catch up. Yeah, uh, in public. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, with people watching over our shoulders. <laughs> so why don't we start off by having you identify uh, how you think of yourself? Uh, that's a, it's a hard question. Um, it's changed over the last many years. I think I used to um, identify myself uh, principally as a, um, as a musician for a long time and then as a visual artist for a while and um, for the last several years. Um, I mostly identify as a software developer um, and as a mediocre chess player. But, you know, most of what I spend my time doing these days is, um, as you mentioned, working for Cycling74 as a developer of Max. Mostly working on, um, well, I started working on Jitter for the first version of Jitter and then gradually moved out into other areas of the software, um, in particular stuff dealing with state management and parameter stuff and max for live and then in the um, recent past i've been working more on some um, more interface facing user facing kinds of things like the the new file browser and stuff in max 7 so it's been sort of an interesting development on the the max end of things but in addition to max and sort of related to my chess obsession um, I've been working with a team of chess programmers on um, a chess program called Komodo. My involvement in it is largely on the fringe, um, basically helping them with more generic programming problems like like threading, like um, integrating external technologies into the base hardcore chess engine. But Komodo is at the moment one of the two. It might be, depends on the week. Um, strongest chess player, uh, chess programs in the world. Um, so that's sort of an interesting project to be to be working on as well, even if it's uh, not really my project. But it's uh, <laughs> right. it's a, kind of fascinating to um, to see how um, a computer simulates a human game. So right. I think that. I'm going to want to come back to that, but before we get there, um, I'm curious about a couple of things of some of your earlier life. So. First of all, you said you originally sort of identified as a musician. What instrument did you play and what kind of work did you do there? Well, I think, yeah, my first instrument was uh, piano. Uh, I mean, I should, I should make it absolutely 100% clear. As an instrumentalist, I am mediocre at best. So I was second chair clarinet um, after taking piano lessons, starting at, I, I think I took piano from 7 to 17 or something like that. Right. Um, and then I played clarinet in elementary school band. Um, at some point, I picked up the trombone for a while because they needed somebody to fill in in the, in the brass section at my high school band. But at that time, I had already started um, taking some music theory classes and some light music history doing some conducting and then by the time I had um, my junior and senior year of high school I had started composing music 
they had this interesting mentorship program in Howard County, Maryland, where I grew up. And you could basically get paired up with a professional in some field of interest and um, meet with them once or uh, once or twice a month, I think. And so I found a composer who was teaching at the time at um, the Peabody Institute, uh, Greg Geiger was his name. And uh, he basically mentored me in um, getting started writing music. At that point, um, I applied to Oberlin College Conservatory of Music in the music composition program and uh, was there for five years wow. and uh, wrote, you know, a lot of music, mostly for instruments, but also kind of had an opportunity starting in my second year there to work in an actual, you know, music studio with computers and uh, boxes that made noises and old ARP 2600 and some, you know, the VCS3 with the Cricklewood keyboard and all these, <laughs> all these great toys. And um, that was actually where I had my first fleeting but impressive contact with Max. So that's kind of my where I got started in, in music. And um, after I left college um, and I moved to New York City, and I had kind of, you know, I had sort of lost then my entire conservatory of music support system, all of these musicians um, that you could kind of knock on doors and get people to play pieces for you. Right, and uh, right. have, you have friends and you're like, okay, well, I'll write something for you because you will, <laughs> you'll humor, you'll humor you'll me, humor and, me right. and actually play it. Um, stuff like that. And so um, I began to take the electronic music stuff um, quite a bit more seriously. And in New York, I was pretty actively involved in writing um, um, a lot of electronic music for theater and dance. Um, that's sort of still where uh, I think I have my, my greatest passion is writing music that people use. Right. Uh, I think that that's really important to me and something that was a bit of a result of the um, the institutional composition background that I had, which is that you just sort of feel like you write piece after piece, it gets played once, and then you put it on the shelf. And um, part of that has to do with being a composer in training. That's just you know the way things happen. But I think that that is um, <laughs> very likely also the experience of any number of professional composers, unless you are. Uh, wildly successful enough that you get multiple performances of your work. Right. Having um, having the opportunity to to work with people who are hungry to hear something new and who are um, who are using it um, made just a huge impression on me. And um, probably then you know fed as well my interest in in working with visuals a little bit later on. So to um, what is, to what extent was Oberlin and that music studio and that computer music environment, to what extent was that your first experience with programming? Or did you have a technical background as well? I didn't really have a technical background, but that said, I guess I've been a nerd since I was a kid. And <laughs> um, like, if I think about it, we didn't have a PC at home, but at some point, I don't remember how old I was. I must have been like nine or 10 years old. And, um, my parents bought this Texas Instruments 99 4A computer that you would load new programs into it either via a cassette player or they had these cartridges. And one of the cartridges that we got was uh, Extended Basic. There used to be a, um, some magazines that would publish, like Byte Magazine or something, right. and they would publish programming listings for like this cool game. And um, if you were lucky, the TI-99 was uh, Spotlight that that month and they would have a couple of programs for your computer and then you know I would just sit down for a couple of days and type out <laughs> word for word the the program listing and at the end I would have some game where you could fly a bee around through a, right. a pixel field of flowers or whatever. Yeah what and, I remember most of that time period is then you had to leave the computer on until you were sick of the game because it, it was almost impossible to get the cassette storage to ever actually work. Right, or you would <laughs> save it off to your, your cassette recorder, of course, yeah. um, and then you could load it back in. It's interesting, I just had another experience with this cassette recorder technology two days ago, but oh we'll talk about that another day or okay. another uh, in, a, in a few minutes. But um, the... Um, 
so there was that at some point when I was a kid, um, I took a, I took a summer school programming workshop and I remember the thing I remember, I don't remember what programs we wrote, but we weren't allowed to actually write our programs until we had made a complete logical flow chart oh, on right. paper mm-hmm. of, I mean, with all the, you know, the logic symbols and symbols right yeah. connected together and then you would bring that up to the front to the teacher and he would like look it over and check your logic and then he'd be like okay you can go to the computer and uh and do that so that was something and um logo i learned at some point in middle school um i made some sort of like break dance <laughs> video using the logo turtle to um herbie Han- was it herbie hancock megamix Right, is that, right. Is that one of his uh, things? It might have been the Thomas Dolby version of the Herbie Can Hancock oh. Mega Man. <laughs> um, anyway, so yeah, that's uh, like this integration of um, visuals and sound and programming has, I guess, been a little bit always a theme right. in my wanderings. But you know, it's not like it's intentional or anything like that. It's just sort of what happens. So, but. Yes. Um, to get back to the actual question, um, that was kind of my first experience using professional, any sort of professional audio equipment. Um, mm-hmm. I had I had a keyboard when I was in high school and I played in a band and uh, we played like Genesis covers and Marillion okay. covers and stuff okay. like that. My trusty uh, Roland Alpha Juno 2 oh, nice. uh, accompanied me on many adventures. Right. Um, playing Abacab, but um, <laughs> but in terms of like having a sequencer, and um, those were like the first years. I think that I was at school at the time when uh, like Vision became Studio Vision and Performer right. became right. Um, Digital Performer, yeah, so and suddenly you were able to have digital audio. I learned Max uh, in summer term, I think, after my second year or something. Um, Gary Nelson. Um, was in charge of the electronic studios back then, and he had a he had a Max summer workshop back then. And um, I wanted to take a class of his the following semester, and I needed to know Max in order to in order to take that class called mathematical modeling and musical composition or something like that, which basically meant music with fractals. Right. So I took his um, or I, I volunteered to TD his summer course as kind of a motivation to learn Max, and that was my first contact with any sort of nice. sound music programming. Right. Back then, Max was a tiny, tiny program that could do MIDI. Yep. And I think there was some extension that would let you play old Macintosh SND files or something. <laughs> yeah. Sort of. Yeah. Back then, it really it was for making MIDI effects and for controlling data flow, and that was my first real experience doing anything that um, that had any kind of musical usefulness. I think it's, you know, it's kind of interesting to think back to those times at how even getting, you know, getting reasonable timing on MIDI from the computers of the time was pretty, pretty tough sledding. And then especially when the digital audio stuff, I was a studio, you know, I took the dive into studio vision when it came out. And I just remember being just blown away that I could get two whole tracks of audio on a computer and right. ready too. You know, it was pretty amazing. And at the at the same time, it it represents limitations that nowadays we would find just completely. La- we would think it was unartistic to use such a thing, right? Yeah, I mean, I had um, I think when I moved to New York, and I had a. Um Oh, what did I have in my? I had some sort of a digital design card in in my computer, and mm-hmm. I think it was a four channel audio card, and that meant that you had four tracks of audio right, right. In, in your sequencer, and you couldn't get any extra tracks. And if you wanted to use more virtual, you couldn't do virtual tracks. You had to actually bounce down. Um, it was like and, using a cassette recorder only exactly. with a computer interface. Yeah, that's kind of crazy. And so I listen, I listen to the tracks I made back then. I'm like, oh my god, you know, I could, I didn't have any, I didn't have crossfades. I right. couldn't, couldn't do any of the sort of flexible things that you can do now. But it still sounded you know, pretty good, didn't it? I think the, because we put the in a lot of extra sweat, you know. Yeah, you you work really hard to get around the limitations, and um, it 
creates friction with your material, and I think that's that's also kind of important yeah, for, for the sure. process. When is it that you started getting into video? Because my under, my recollection is that you were sort of doing video work prior to working for cycling. You were kind of you were doing performances because I've heard a lot of people talk about some of your early performances as being really influential to them in terms of getting into in, into computer based visual work. Oh, that's nice to hear. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, I think I was already working for cycling oh, okay. when I did this. My first job for cycling was maintaining the the forum. Oh, all right. Um, I think um, if if I can digress for the story of me working for cycling was um, I wrote this really long email. There used to be this uh, McGill list for for the Max community and um, I wrote this long email about how it's ridiculous that the uh, that this company with this vibrant community doesn't have its own mailing list and <laughs> um, this is a big pain in the butt and could we uh, could cycling pl- please you know consider doing something like this and then I got an email back from uh, from David at some point I had been doing a little bit of beta testing and at some point in the in, Previous to that, I had sent him an email, and I was like, I can't do anything, but do you have a position at cycling for somebody like that? He, at the time, had responded in the negative that, in <laughs> fact, there was, there, there was no position at cycling at that time for somebody right. who couldn't do anything. But after I wrote this email on the, on the old mailing list, he wrote me, well, actually, you know, if you wanted to spearhead this effort, that's probably uh, something that somebody who can't do anything could do. Um, <laughs> Um, and why don't we give it a shot? And so that was my first job um, at cycling. But the video stuff, I wasn't doing any programming for cycling. And in fact, I wasn't doing any programming um, outside of Max. I didn't know how to program in a text language except for Logo and Extended Basic. So at that time, we were using NATO, I guess, was um, was what was available for, for Max to, to use video. And I had always been frustrated with Max because I, I found Max as sort of like a live, as a processing environment where you could make kind of cool textures and then maybe reuse them somewhere or for making a kind of like a, a basic sound installation. That's how I'd used Max in the past um, or for doing sort of media manipulation. But I'd never figured out a way to compose using um, this programming methodology. Um, okay. And that was always very frustrating to me. Sure. However, when NATO came out, um, I was sort of very excited about the, the possibilities of working with images. And, and that came a little bit out of my, my work with theater and dance, where I was working a lot with kind of a visual context for the work that I was doing, um, for the musical work that I was doing. But the downside of that was that I had to deal with these actors and these dancers and these directors and you know sometimes you just want to do something alone and but I was missing this visual element so I thought okay well maybe maybe there's something here maybe I can maybe I can find my own visual environment to work within and maybe this tool will help me and I think that the fact that I was such a a naive novice in the video world I had studied art history. Um, I did a double degree program at Oberlin, and three of my years there were were working on an art history degree before I dropped out of that program. But um, so I had some some background in visual art, but not as a maker, um, more as a, a you know an academic. Right. But you know, as a as a, a visual artist, I had absolutely no credentials whatsoever, um, and so I felt a certain freedom to work with these visual materials that I didn't really have with the with the musical materials where I was a little bit you know stuck in certain ways of working as the result of you know several years of practice of, of making the kind of music that I was liking so I was I was you know very inspired to kind of to play around with these toys and at a certain point I, I realized that the kinds of things that I wanted to do were taxing the system too much and so I learned how to write enough C to write some faster graphics filters in order to use these, uh, these NATO tools. And at that time, I, would, uh, I got a job, or not a job, a, you know, a gig, doing some VJing at Subtonic, which was the, the basement club underneath Tonic 
right. in in the Lower East Side of New York. Kurt Ralski got me the gig, and we did kind of like a, a video tag team, and that was this incredible laboratory for me because. I had a day job. I was fixing laptops, and in the evening, I would come home and fixing laptops. You don't use your brain at all. You, <laughs> you, you use your hands. It's, right, it's basically right, sure. you know you're unscrewing things. And right. back then, you could actually take a laptop apart and replace things. And right. um, you were a screwdriver user at the time. I was a screwdriver user, and my brain was free all day to think about what I was going to do that night. Mm -hmm. And um, so I would come home pull out whatever compiler it is that we were using and I'd, I'd start working on some filter that I had an idea for. And then on Friday night, we'd go down to, to Subtonic and um, I'd get to try out my new filters. Right. And uh, some of them would be cool and some of them would be horrible and some of them would be too slow, whatever. You just get this, Im not immediate, but this uh, immediate enough feedback as part of the development of this kind of like large VJ program that I was working on um, just for me right. and then all the filters that um, that were built into it and so that was an incredibly productive time both artistically but also um, in terms of my development of programming chops right right although it was interesting because for years I couldn't actually program any I couldn't like program a program right. <laughs> um, in in C the only thing I knew how to make were max objects max objects yeah <laughs> I hear that it's interesting that you talk about uh, working on laptops freeing your brain you know when I first started doing programming that was almost exactly my experience I was I had a job as the maker of crates I was the person <laughs> who, who made crates and so it was, I mean, it was such a prescribed job that I knew that I could do uh, two crates an hour, 16 crates a day, no matter how fast or how slow I tried working, it would, it would be exactly the same, right? So right. I was a hammer user and <laughs> um, I kept a little notebook where I would like scratch ideas so I could run home and code them up when I got home, right? And that was, that was how I kind of got started as well. Thank God for these kind of like low end labor jobs that let us all get our wrap our heads around it, right? <laughs> They're good jobs if you can get them. I guess. So you were a NATO user, and what I recall is you ended up in kind of a shit storm over that, right? Um, um, mainly because the developer of the NATO software was, you know, perhaps insane. <laughs> Um, I had my license officially revoked, um, like so many of us back then. The, right. um, I don't remember if it was revoked because I was thinking badly or if it was revoked because I was being accused of stealing her intellectual property. Or for but, being American. I mean, or there was for, a It could have been that I was an imperialist American. Yes, it yes. Could be. But yeah, for the benefit of anybody who's listening who doesn't know... Um, what NATO was or who, who its maker was. So NATO was this video framework for Max pre-jitter developed by a, a kind of collective called Natachka Nesvanova. Natachka Nesvanova was, in addition to being the programmer of this thing, of, <laughs> of this modular system, I think her greatest talent was destroying online communities. Right. There were any number of sort of like arts-based online communities where she showed up and um, she kind of spoke in this combination of ASCII art and Danish and punctuation, yeah. um, so lead speak, and would get all the tight asses really annoyed and all of the the hippies would be like, you know, don't oh, harsh our mellow, she's yeah. okay, it's all right. <laughs> and uh, eventually it would lead to her getting banned and then half the community leaving because protesting that some women would get banned for being special and whatever. So complicated personality, but uh, anyway, there was a bunch of research done. I remember I was interviewed, it must have been yet uh, 10 years ago or something. Somebody was doing a documentary about, about her. Um, I don't know if that ever, if that ever came out. The last I heard, there was a programmer in, like a Romanian programmer living in the suburbs of Chicago. There was Rebecca Wilson from New Zealand, who um, 
She sort had of was name. like the face of it. Right? She was the face, and she had had her name officially changed to Natasha Nesmanova, and she got the job at at, at Stein in Amsterdam. In Amsterdam, so she had the production manager job at Stein, and then uh, left later to make a Pro Tools plugin or something like that. And then there was a third one who I think was the poet, who probably was responsible for any number of the of the emails. In any case, that was a super cool, very interesting system written for Max um, that lets you do things um, with visuals that were just impossible to consider. Yeah, um, it was it was so visionary David. for however one felt about Natashka. The work at the time was real visionary work. Yeah, I mean the idea that you could you know pass around a. Uh, a bitmap and break it into pieces and process each one separately and put it back. I mean, just the same way that you were doing with, with sound in Max and in other programs. But, you know, nobody had really been able to do that in, in visuals yet. David Rokeby was, was approaching that as well with his very nervous system. Right, right. But I think the very nervous system was still a, um, a monolithic object that did a lot of stuff. At the time that NN released NATO modular, and David made the the modular version of the very nervous system later. That was also super powerful. Then Jitter came out shortly thereafter, and you know Joshua had started working on Jitter. Even well, he had started working on Jitter, I guess, already in 2000. I met him for the first time in 2000 at the Deaf Festival. He was already programming Proto Jitter at that point. I got involved. I don't know, maybe nine months later. And my, my, you know, my original job working on that was um, just porting my NATO filters over to um, the Jitter framework, but then it got a little bit out of hand. I want to ask you a little bit about what New York was like at the time, because my recollection was while people in spots all around the world were kind of playing around with digital generated video, it seemed like New York was really a center for this laptop video thing. I mean, you and Kurt particularly were, were people that were doing a lot of groundbreaking stuff. But, but, you know, I remember I interviewed Josh Goldberg. He was like, you know, he started off hauling VCR decks around and then ran across this stuff and started messing with it. You know, there was a lot of activity in New York at the time. What was it about New York that was specifically video driven? Was it just that there was this club or some clubs or was there something else that was kind of, at least in your experience, that was kind of involved? Uh, Yeah, it's really hard. It's really, really hard to say. Um, I think it was just sort of a, it was a moment. It was like the moment where this became technically possible without having to lug a video synthesizer around with you. Sure. I mean, we still had to lug our projector um, <laughs> yeah. around. I mean, it wasn't like, um, and, you know, our laptops and whatever. But but I think this was sort of like the, the cutting edge moment where suddenly you could do this with a laptop. Right. But, you know, kind of at Subtonic, there, was, um, there were nights where people would come in um, with like, you know, the equivalent of a lamp and a flashlight. And they would, they would do graphics or an overhead projector and stuff like that. I mean, our night was just, it was just digital, but it wasn't like, um, right. I mean, there was, there was like subtonic. There was also a couple of years later, there was, there was this, um, this place called the remote lounge, which was, <laughs> um, it was maybe like, you know, the equivalent, it must've been like around 2000 and it was the, the 2000 era version of, um, Tinder. Oh. Um, and the idea was that you had all these consoles strewn throughout the bar and each console could be, um, had a camera and might've had a microphone. I don't remember, but each console could then switch to any of the other consoles. And if you saw something that you liked, you could press the, uh, you could press a button and notify the other console that somebody would like to talk to them. So it was essentially a, uh, it was essentially a pickup bar, but, um, it was based on technology in their dungeon, they also had um, a nice setup with a pretty well-stocked video booth and a good screen and a built-in projector and everything kind of set up so that you could come in and um, set up your gear and do uh, an audiovisual show. 
there were a couple of places uptown, I can't remember what they're called anymore, where they had sort of lab nights where people would come and do, it wasn't like circuit bending, it was basically come and plug in and show us what you're working on kind of nights. Kind of like they're doing the bring your own beamer stuff now. And, you know, New York, of course, has, it has the new school, it has NYU, it has Columbia, it's got all these places with heavy technology and, you know, computer design programs. You had Luc Dubois at Columbia back then, little Joshua Goldberg was teaching at New School. And I think it was just a, it was a good moment where the fact that this stuff was now possible made people interested in it, and the fact that people were able to get jobs teaching this or going out and, and gigging this um, made it all the more interesting. So that's, uh, that does sound like a pretty amazing time. Now, you got involved in Jitter, and that story seems pretty amazing because you guys did a, a shocking amount of work in a small amount of time. What was your primary work in with Jitter? Um, well, yeah, as I, as I mentioned, like my original job assignment, I think that I had written like 25 or 30 filters for oh, okay. uh, NATO, and my initial job assignment was like, take the filters that you've already written and, um, you know, port them over to this new system. And um, so I did that. I think that took like, you know, a week. And I was like, well, is, is there anything else I can do? And um, at, the, at that point, my, um, you know, I had learned to program a slightly bit, uh, a little bit more uh, effectively. And um, I started taking over um, a bunch of the, like, the basic movie playback um, stuff, adding, um, I think the, the original version had basic, simple um, playback with play control. Um, it might have had a sequence grabber um, to use a camera. Um, it might have had a way to record the disc. But anyway, um, I basically took over the QuickTime development and um, build all those objects out um, to the point where they were basically um, able to reproduce um, most of what you could do inside of the QuickTime app um, and uh, do some rudimentary editing out of Max. So um, that probably got a lot bigger. And in terms of the shocking amount of work done in a shocking short amount of time, uh, we just didn't sleep very much, I think. (laughs) Um, I remember at the... At the time, I would really sit on my couch for 12 hours at a time and just, like, crank out code like like crazy. You know, I was also 25 years old, um, so it was a little bit easier to find the time and find the energy to, to do that, you know, just sort of, like, drink coffee until coffee doesn't help anymore and right. then go to bed for a few hours and start over. Yeah, so my principal contribution was in addition to the, the like pixel or a lot of the pixel processing filters was then the QuickTime architecture. Oh, right. <clears throat> Let's, because uh, I'm already burning through time. This is ridiculous. I, I, yeah, have, about a, I, I have about talking. hours of, well, no, I have hours more stuff I'd like to ask you about. But I want to I talk about something particular to your interests now which is chess and i'm i'm having i have to admit maybe i can understand coming from like the programming thing but your background wasn't heavy duty programming it was more music and art how does that translate into a guy who becomes obsessed with chess because if i recall last time we talked you were like you would go like on chess trips and stuff like that right I don't think I've ever taken a chess trip. Oh, okay. Um, well, I thought but, that, like, you know, took never, a never, never say never. It, <laughs> I mean, uh, you can buy all-inclusive uh, chess vacation packages and go to some sort of like take a chess cruise. Yeah, chess whatever. cruise. That's what Believe I was it. thinking. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, I, I have not sunk so deep yet. Okay. Um, so yeah, I mean, I have essentially an obsessive personality. I tend to work in these sort of. Um, bursts of frenetic activity um, punctuated by long periods of not getting much done. Anyway, that's um, like my obsession with working with video was was one of these. My obsession with 
um, working on certain kinds of, of music is um, is another one. Then I moved to Berlin in 2004, and so um, I was then for uh, several years obsessed with learning German. And after um, I got good enough at that, I needed, of course, a new obsession. And um, <laughs> I was reading a book by sort of bad that I don't remember who the author was. It was either a Stanislav Lem book or it was by the Strigatsky brothers, the guys who wrote um, uh, Roadside Picnic. Anyway, in one of these books, there was this, it was basically an East Bloc author, and there was this hallucinogenic scene in the middle of the science fiction novel, which was all a huge chess metaphor, and I didn't understand any of it. And I was like, okay, well... I guess I have to learn enough chess to understand what these last 30 pages were just about. Okay. And that's kind of how it got started, and it got a little bit out of hand. Um, that was about six or seven years ago, and um, I'll put it right out there. I'm still not very good, but I'm a lot, <laughs> I'm a lot better than I was back then. Um, I'm not sure if I put in my 10,000 hours yet. I hope not, because if this is the best thing I'm going to get, <laughs> um, that's a little bit depressing. Right, I hear you. But I started from, yeah, I knew the rules when I was a kid, um, but nobody in my family played chess, and I always found the the pieces really beautiful. We had, like, battle chess, where the pieces would, would kill each other with swords. Um, right. On the, it was like, <laughs> on your old uh On your Mac VGA SE. computer or whatever, yeah. Um, but I never played seriously, and... Um, and so I actually decided that I was going to learn how to play chess. And so I went out and I got a book and I joined business. I think I joined five online chess communities on the first day. And I was like, okay, I'm going to start, start playing this game. I'm going to start winning. I'm going to start making some money here. And, um, well, that didn't really work out. Quickly got my ass handed to me in uh, serious portions and realized that this was actually a really, really deep and really hard subject. Yeah, and I still spend a lot of time doing this. I've got a trainer. He's a neurologist from Romania, um, and I meet him once a week on a chess platform, and we go over my games from the previous week. I'm going to be playing in a tournament uh, where I am seated number 201 out of 250 participants. So I'm sort of like the best of the thing, or maybe the worst of the mediocre. Um, <laughs> I'm satisfied sort of with that as long as I see that I'm making progress. Right. I'm the, the captain of my chess works like a sport. I mean, no matter how, wh whether you think of chess as a sport or not, it kind of works like that. And there are these um, playing leagues. So if you think like the, um, like the top football leagues, like Bayern München, for instance, in, in soccer, is essentially a football club. So I'm also in one of these um, sport clubs for chess. They've got like teams that play in the world, um, like the the Chess Olympics and stuff like that. And I'm like the captain of the the lowest team in the <laughs> in the chess club. So you know I'm uh, you know I'm really making my way in the chess world. Anyway, it's a very interesting um, it's a very interesting topic. It's the sort of thing like I try to explain stuff to my wife, and she's just like she starts yawning immediately. Right. I was like, you can't, you can't talk to me about this. This is something I'm not very interested in. You know, I, th I think I've managed to keep a good um, life chess balance. <laughs> right. So far, um, chess has bled over a little bit into my, my job life. I wrote an object for Max that allows you to host chess engines, um, and it has a nice interface so you can let chess computer programs play against each other and see that in Max and get all kinds of numerical data these chess engines and use it to control your air conditioning right, so right. Home or whatever it is to use Max for. So that's that's sort of been fun. But in general, it's sort of a way to blow off steam in addition to being obsessive, um, fairly aggressive. And so it's sort of nice to have a, a non-violent, uh, what's the word I'm, I'm looking for? In addition to... Outlet. Um, outlet. Yeah, since moving to Germany, I've become a non-native speaker in any language. It's kind of amazing. <laughs> uh, um, I used to be able... I, I used to have an extremely good grammar in English. At this point, I speak like a, an eight-year-old in both languages. It's right. a little bit frustrating. Anyway, the, um, so yeah, I have an outlet for my aggression um, where I get to like, eat the living shit out of the... Um, 
the guy sitting across from me on the board and watch him sweat. Um, chess players are <laughs> unbelievable sweaters. Um, and um, especially when they're losing, and it's not this kind of like, I'm losing, but I'm exerting myself, kind of like sports sweat, where it's sort of like you smell, you smell sweat. If you go into a chess hall, like half the people smell like onions, and the other half smell like nervous sweat. Oh my God. And um, it's a real incredible, it's a really incredible scene. My wife came to pick me up from uh, one of these tournaments one day and she walked in and she kind of turned green and had to, <laughs> had to go back out, <laughs> to bug out sort yeah. of like i'll wait for you outside wow. um it's a very special environment but you know i'm i'm not ashamed there you go well jeremy i want to thank you for a great conversation that was that was awesome and like i said i wish i had another couple of hours because there's a bunch more stuff i'd love to talk about but um, that was a lot of great stuff. One last question um, that I like to ask people sometime. If you were to meet a 20-year-old version of yourself, what advice or anti-advice would you give somebody like that? I would probably tell my 20-year-old self, don't quit your day job. Um, <laughs> I think if I had kept my, uh, my screwdriver jockey job and kept making music in the evenings, um, I would have had a very different. I mean, I'm not saying it would have been a better life, but it would have been a, it would have been a, a much different life than I ended up having. Um, I think that becoming a programmer changed the way I see the world, changed the way I interact with computers in an, in an essential way. It changed the way I interact with other people's software and my own software as a creative person in an essential way because I no longer see bugs as problems to work around i think that that has i think that has negative repercussions right my on my ability personally as a creative as a creative person right. and so i tend i kind of wish in certain ways that i remained a, a dumb musician a naive user um on the other hand you know it's sort of like i think i got to be a programmer or learning to be a programmer in an interesting field at a very interesting time yeah. And I'm super, I'm really happy to experience that. Um, it's fascinating right now to see how there's this trend back into hardware, yep. which, you know, I'm also getting a bit into as well. Um, I, due to my self-knowledge that I am obsessive, I am not going to buy a Eurorec anything <laughs> because I'll then want all of them. But, yes. um, but playing with hardware makes it's more cool. It's so much more satisfying in, in many ways than than programming oscillators and, right. and doing hookups and software. Anyway, the, um, I guess if, if my 20-year-old self heard me rambling and raving like this, he would probably be like, dude, I'm not going to do what you did. But the um, in, in any case, I think um, keep your head clear. <laughs> <laughs> um, find time every day to do something you find boring because uh, that's that's when good thinking happens <laughs> well thank you so much i really appreciate it and have a great day man hey you too have a nice uh have a nice time on top of the mountain i'll do it all right bye yeah bye and there you have it another great chat with a really smart person uh it's really interesting that chess came up chess been hopping up in my life a lot lately my friend Mark Moser has been talking about it a lot. It's been very influential to him. Uh, he turned me on to the old Microsoft Press books about learning winning chess, which I've just started reading. But it's all about kind of the st strategy behind uh, serious chess playing, which is really interesting. And um, I'm sure I'm just never going to take it on because I'm not sure I want to be a beginner in something again. It sounds like hard work. But nevertheless, I want to thank Jeremy a lot for spending the time talking about it and talking to us. Thanks to you for listening. Uh, please, if you have any ideas for, uh, for people to interview, or if you'd like to be interviewed yourself, please drop me a line. DDG at Cycling74 will get you there. Otherwise, keep listening, and thanks a lot for your support. Talk to you later.